So I have the pleasure of introducing our morning keynote speakers. For those of you who do not know or have not ever heard Anne and Rob Turnbull, you're in for an incredible treat. These are two remarkable people. Um, they are co-founders of the and co-directors of the Beach Center on Disability. They are both Mariana and Ross Beach distinguished professors in special education. Um, Anne has done a significant amount of research on uh, family support, family professional partnerships, and community inclusion. And Rudd has done a lot of research on disability-related issues, specifically full participation, independent living, economic self-sufficiency, equal opportunity. So between the two of them, there's just a broad range of issues. And they have personal experience within their own family um, with their son, Jay. In, um, as parents of someone with a disability. So with all of that, I know they have an enormous amount to share with us this morning. I'm really looking forward to hearing from them, and I am thrilled that they're here. So please welcome Ann and Rod. back in Connecticut. I used to live here. Uh, and uh, I remember spring being exactly what it is. Quite <laughs> cold, but once you're inside, it's very fresh. It is good to be here. Thank you very much, Molly and Mary Beth. Um, and 10 sponsors. Thank you all. Anne and I are now 150 years old. <laughs> I feel like about 120 and she's still 30. I don't know why she keeps staying at the age of 30, but I'm delighted that she does. And what we want to do this morning is to have the 30-year-old tell you some of life's lessons and this old guy here to tell you others. We're going to tell you some stories about our lives. And as we do, we're going to make a couple of points. Uh, we call them lessons for life. And point number one, I, I'm with the Assistant Technology Act, and I don't know how to use a pointer. <laughs> That's what they do to lawyers. Um, Point number one is you can never be prepared enough for what happens to you. You can never be prepared enough. Let me give you an example. Anne and I both have been married before. We've been in Chapel Hill, North Carolina in 1973, coming out from divorces. I said, Anne, one night, uh, would you marry me? And she said, for one night I would marry you. <laughs> the first thing she said is, the first thing we will do is to bring Jay home. Now, Jay, biological mother, and I had separated and divorced. And he was in a private school in Rhode Island, in Pasco, Rhode Island. You can never be prepared enough. You can always be prepared to be surprised. And Anne's condition of marrying me was the first thing we'll do is bring Jay home. Talk about surprise. The second thing that happened that surprised us was that on January 7, 2009, Jay, ready for his shower, died instantly. Uh, it was painless. He had no sense of it. He just died. <coughs> And one can never be prepared enough for that. One had always assumed, we had always assumed, that Jay would outlive us. But that was not to be the case. So lesson one is don't be surprised by what happens. You can never be fully prepared. we were 150, you might have wondered kind of how that happened. We both had zero birthdays within 
several weeks of each other, and he was 80 and I was 70, so that's how we ended up to be 150. And my aunt then decided to be 30, but 30 is the new 70. <laughs> is 120. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to back up some and tell you about what happened in between uh, Jay uh, coming to be part of our family uh, and his untimely death. Uh, what was it? Uh, 34 years later. Uh, so uh, first, in terms of the people in here, you represent many different lifespan stages. Some of you are more focused on early childhood and some on adulthood. In terms of our own family life, the most challenging times for us were the adolescent years and early adulthood when we were trying to figure out what Jay's life would be as an adult. Jay started out with the uh, label of intellectual disability uh, when he was in elementary school, he picked up the label of autism, and his most challenging disability was a bipolar disorder that was diagnosed as he was reaching adulthood, and that ranged between very low depression and being so hyped up he couldn't sleep maybe for a week was uh, very, very challenging for him. When this was in the 1980s, late 80s, <laughs> when he was uh, transitioning into high school. And then, and even now, throughout Connecticut and throughout every state in the country, the typical thing had been for people with quite significant intellectual disability to go to a sheltered workshop where it was only people with disabilities, a very segregated environment, uh, and to live in a group home with other people with disabilities. Rudd and I were advocating very hard in our community that Jay should have a chance for supported employment, which was just coming on the scene then, of having a job coach and a typical job, uh, and then having supported living in terms of having a home that where it was not a group home, but his own home. Well, we kept being told hundreds of times that we were just unrealistic and that we wouldn't accept the extent of Jay's disability. And that's what happened to all other people, far more capable than him. So why did we think it was even, you know, a faint possibility that he could have an inclusive adult, adult life? Well, uh, we were in a community where there was the top graduate program in special education, University of Kansas. And just a couple miles from campus was this oh, adult program that provided very few options. So our strategy was to get on the board of directors of the adult agency and that we would work to change it. Well, what we learned is the more we pushed for an inclusive vision, the more they resisted and the more, and I remember the chairman of the board of directors said to us, what you two don't understand is that we're satisfied. We're satisfied with what we have. We're satisfied with this congregate approach and they weren't going to change. Well, Jay went into that. He was accustomed to being treated with dignity and he felt a lot of things that happened there not very dignifying. Well, um, he had limited communication, uh, but he had one skill that he pulled out of his portfolio skills um, to express his unhappiness and his sense of, of being demeaned. And that skill, I'm sorry to tell you, was hitting and choking. The more unhappy he became in his setting, the more his problem behavior escalated. The more it escalated, the more he was put into time out for extended periods of time. The more he was in time out, the more depressed he became, and the more he hit and choked. But you know, Jay Turnbull had an IQ way, way, way down the scale 
if we want to talk about IQ measurement, but a brilliant decision on his part, unfortunately, it's not that ever hitting and choking would be brilliant, but given that he picked the state legislator's son to hit and choke, <laughs> was a very quick way for Jay to be expelled from the only adult program in our community. He picked the person whose family had so much power to get him out. And can you imagine what a profound reputation he had? For I mean, every day we were getting calls about the latest hitting and choking. It was just awful, 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 awful. But before he was he had taken that route, um, his younger sister, let me get our slides here, um, his younger sister went to visit with him and she was in fourth grade then, her name was Kate, and she came home from his group home and she was really upset and she wouldn't talk and, and she kept giving us the look. Those of you who are parents, you know the look from your children, don't you, when they're really unhappy with you? She gave us the look and finally she said, Mom, I wouldn't want to live there, you wouldn't want to live there, why is it okay for Jay to live there? Yikes. That really hurts, doesn't it? That got us to our core. And so we thought, this, we have got to change this situation, and we can't allow Jay even though we were working to get it better, it was the only program in town that it was below the line of acceptability. We went to the director of the program, and the director of the program had called this meeting so he could tell us he was expelling Jay after he had just been there for several months. And we were trying to beat into the punch, and so we told him that we were withdrawing Jay. And we were going to commit to supported living and supported employment for Jake. And he said something that, you know, is seared in our souls. It's seared like the day we heard about 9-11, you know, where we were, the day we heard President Kennedy was shot, where we were. He said to us, what are you going to do, Ann and Rudd, when you fail? And he knew that Jay was one of the least, uh, you know, capable in his thinking people in the program. There was no way that Jay could do this and that someday we would be coming back to him and getting on his rating list and we would be begging our way back into the only program in town. Now, can you, I've started out pretty mouthy. Can you imagine me speechless? Yeah, Rod says no. <laughs> but you know I was. Yes. I was speechless because we were so afraid. We were so tired. We'd been trying to do our jobs to raise our other two children, to spend over half of our time on advocacy, and we were just going down in quicksand, and we didn't know what we were going to do. And the last thing we wanted to do was start a new adult program in our town. We were weary from the, the school advocacy that it had taken all of those years. But Rudd, this wonderful man, said to, to the director, we're not going to fail. We're going to succeed. And that's not a threat. That's a promise. Come on, Ann. We're out of here. <laughs> we were going to do, but we were both saying, as Dr. King said, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we're free at last. It was like we were free from the system that was paid to help us. Isn't that crazy? We were so excited to be free from the shackles of this is all that Jay could do, this living in this environment that he disliked so much. Well, so, um, we started moving on to how are we going to put this life together? We hired a guy uh, 
to, to start one activity a week for Jay. Here he was, the first generation of what was then 94, 142, now IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. He was out of school. He was kicked out of the adult program, and we were starting from blank slate. So in the blank slate, we started uh, hiring a guy uh, who would take Jay to exercise. And um, as luck would have it, um, the universe came in to help us. This guy was the resident advisor at the fraternity on the University of Kansas campus. So Rudd, tell him about the fraternity experience. Since, since Rudd's not very good at it, advancing, I'm advancing. <laughs> I was actually 120 years old. One morning more. All right. Lesson number two. You can never know where your help lies. You can never know where your help lies. Jay goes down to the fraternity, the Sigma Alpha Epsilon fraternity at the University of Kansas. <coughs> And he begins to make friends. And you see pictures of him here. He's sitting in a, a room with a dormitory room at the fraternity house. He's listening to John Denver and James Taylor. James Taylor, one of the great ones over here. He's got his SAE shirt on. He's at a Kansas University basketball game. Hard to get tickets to those. Kind of like going to the Huskies to watch the women play. Uh, he just was having a whale of a good time. Now the great thing is, you can scratch where you need to scratch at a fraternity house. You can make any sounds from your body that your body wants to make at a fraternity house. If you do a little bit of tapping on somebody, just a little bit of harder than usual, that's not a big deal at a fraternity house. So, Jay's behavior at the fraternity house was absolutely normal. <laughs> it was completely perfect. Here's a lesson. You never know where your help lies, but the other lesson is this. Find a community in which your child fits easily. And if the child doesn't fit easily, the problem is the environment, it's not your child. So, here's the question. Which of these three young men has an intellectual disability, autism, and emotional behavioral disorder? Take a look at it. You, no, seriously, can you distinguish Jay Turnbull from his two fraternity brothers? No. You get the point? It was a wonderful environment for Jay. And because he had a friend, the resident advisor, and he made friends over at the fraternity, two of the young men came to Jay and us and said, we want to initiate him. Is that okay? Well, our fantasy was, sure, that's great, but what about a sorority house? Can it get initiated? <laughs> Always looking for something higher. You know, great expectations. Well, the other point was that you rely upon your friends. And in this slide, that's what they say. And in this slide, you see Jay, the young man with the plaid shirt on, Pat Hughes from Illinois, was a member of the fraternity. He was the man who came to Jay and to us and said, we not only want to initiate Jay into the fraternity, but we also want to live with Jay. Jay is 21, 22 years old. He doesn't need to be living at home. He should live in the community with us and so out into the community we went with Pat Hughes, Corey Royer, two young fellows from the SAE fraternity house, and they lived together, and that was the beginning of 20 years of independence. If you look at the next slide, let's begin. Hold on this one. Here's Pat. Jay is getting his first paycheck from the director of the university affiliated program at the University of Kansas. She had been our doctoral student. And here he is. He had said when he was in the workshop, J, 
Chokey, the son of the Sudan senator, where do you want to work? He said, Code and Tar. You see what he was saying? He wanted to wear, he wanted to work in a place where he was dignified for the work that he did. And here he is in a coat and tie receiving his very first paycheck. Jay is on the road to what we all want for our children. He did regular work for the regular wage that we have paid an undergraduate or a graduate student to do. Tell me what types of tasks. What types of tasks? And here, if you just look at the next slide, you'll see that he's sorting the mail. Jay could not read his last name if it were written in 10 foot high letters on a bulletin on a barn door. But he could read the first two letters of any word. So he was capable of sorting the mail for our research center, which, you know, at one point had 30, at another point had. 75 different people working in it. He did the recycling. He did the postal service between three different buildings. He took the bus to work. He walked across three buildings and various walkways and down and so on and so forth. Never got lost. He basically did everything that an undergraduate student would do with an IQ of 44. Not the student. Student would have been admitted to the university, but Jay was in the university doing that person's work. You never know where your friends will be, who will they be, how they will show up, and part of the lessons is build the friendships. Anne's going to talk to you a little bit about doing that. Um. Before we get into the friendships, um, and, and actually part of the friendship was um, Jay's home. Who would have thought that fraternity guys would have come to us and said, we want to be Jay's roommate? And we think one of the reasons that happens so rarely for people is most of the time, if Jay had stayed in the adult program, he would have been going around in groups of eight or ten, six or eight or ten. And it's hard to make friends with a group of six or eight or ten people. But when he started going around with one or two guys in the fraternity, it was a different experience of getting to have friends. And that's one of the things we need to focus on from the very beginning, is friends. Because those are the friends who are going to be opening doors across the lifespan. Um, this was uh, Jay's house that he lived in with uh, full-time housemates who provided support to him. Jay didn't cook. Uh, he had a hard time getting a clean shave. Uh, he didn't tell time or count money. But he was able to live with support. He, this house, it was very fortunate that we were able to swim this, was a block from his job. And so he could walk to work. Um, he had lived in one house when Red was talking about riding the bus, but then we moved closer to work. So we set up the home so if something happened, he couldn't be kicked out. If it didn't work with the housemate, then the housemate would leave and we would find someone else. But Jay could have controlled the, the front door. Was he able to make all the decisions of purchasing a house or working out the arrangements? No but he could partially participate in those decisions given the extent of his intellectual disability. His choices, his preferences, the people he was comfortable with, those were all the things that with us, he was guiding the process. Well, Jay loved music more than anything, and when he left the adult program, we thought, how are we going to get Jay involved in the music life of the community? And then we thought, well, gosh, at the University of Kansas, there's a music therapy program, and there's students in music therapy who need to have internships. And so every semester for 21 years, Jay had two or three students doing internships with him. Um, this student um, 
taught Jay to play two colored cord, coded chords on the guitar. And Jay absolutely loved that. Nothing we ever thought he might be able to do, but these students, huh, where other people had seen, this is what we were talking about last night with Darla, where so many <coughs> people in the system saw disability, these new people in his life saw possibility, and it made all of the difference. Uh, Jay would host a lot of parties, and you know, there have been so many IEP meetings, but instead of having IEP meetings, have people over, give Jay a chance to shine, celebrate, and that was so much a part of building the friendship network. Uh, Jay's girlfriend, woman friend, Dana, uh, who he had met uh, when he was in high school, and they were very bonded with each other and had a um, supportive, loving relationship. Um, not fully and completely as a, an adult would have who perhaps did not have a disability, but a life that was very satisfying to them. You, you don't need to go into <laughs> and, uh, Then uh, when Jay was in the group home, um, one of the things that he would do, you know, is pull hair of the state legislator's son who had a dark ponytail. And then that behavior generalized to other people with long hair uh, when, um, when Jay would get very anxious. This is a picture of Jay on the bus. You know, it still kind of scares me to think about this co-ed sitting in front of him with this long hair. But he was able to overcome those deep-seated behaviors that he had relied on in his moments of intensive anxiety. And what we so much want to say to you is people who you think may not have the possibility for a great life do have the possibility. And it's our creativity and it's a building a life according to preferences, building on strengths, uh, living in a way that as we go back to Kate, that other people would want to live. We kind of came up with a term for that. We call it an enviable life. Not envy and a mean envy, but envy and how could we build a life that Kate would feel good about for herself or that we would want to live ourselves. At one conference I was talking about the en enviable life and a woman came up afterwards and said, honey, I'm a Catholic and envy is a sin. <laughs> so I'm not, a, I know Mary Beth, you're a Catholic. I'm not asking you to go against your doctrine, but it's a positive envy, uh, the envy the right way. So look at this dancing. Rudd is going to tell you about the fun of a community inclusion. Another lesson in life is if you don't like what's out there, change it. I want to tell you that you need to change the name of the IEP. It's called the Individualized Education Program. And just use the word possibility. I want you, from now on, to call the IEP the Individualized Education Probability. Not possibility, not a program, but a probability. Because probability says what is not just likely, but what is very likely. So part of this whole business of, of great life is to reshape what you've got. And here, here's the picture of, of Jay dancing. Here we are. Jay loves music, and one of his buddies was a music therapist, and she had a band, and they would go to this skanky jazz house Oh God, it was awful. It had Smith. It smelled like my fraternity house when I was in college. It had beer so soaked into it that you could not smell anything except beer. In some cases, it was a good thing. Uh, he went dancing one night, and here's the lady. She's playing the piano, and Jay gets up, and he decides to dance. And this is how he danced. He was a little bit spite footed. He would. This was this is dance. You, you can see it. <laughs> he was out on the dance floor all by himself, and you know, 50 or so patrons drinking beer were looking at Jay. Jay's up there, and the 
pianist, Jay's friend realized, oh my gosh, he's all by himself. And she said, ladies and gentlemen, you have just been introduced to the newest dance craze in Lawrence, Kansas. It's called the JT Shuffle. Everybody up and do the JT Shuffle. And she played the song again, and by God, the whole dance floor got it. <laughs> Now, if you get bored when Dan and I are talking, especially when I'm talking, stand up to the JT shuffle and sit down. And here's, here's the point. If you don't like what's there, change it. It's the IE probability. It's not just dancing by yourself. It's dancing with other people. And Jay's weekly support went from scant to abundant. This is his week at a glance, and I just want to read to you. Oh, he had a period of sleep, that's good. Personal <laughs> care, that's also good. Work, that's a necessity. Leisure and community partnership time, the JT shop. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner, speech therapy, because he, you have to get along with people. It's not about articulation. It's about social skills and communication. Music therapy, of course, playing the guitar. Remember? Massage. Because we believed in wellness. Yoga, because we believed in wellness. And church, because we believed in God. And when Jay died, we went back to church a while later, sitting in the same pew, a lady reached over and she said, you know, I never prayed in the Lord's Prayer out loud because I always wanted to hear Jay say, thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Can you get it? Can you just get it? So your life can be and will be abundant, not scant. And that is the aspiration. Seek the enviable life, seek the great life. And as a lawyer, for me, that aspiration has three dimensions, four <coughs> dimensions. The first is equal opportunity. You talk about IEPs, 504 plans, ADA compliance, all of that, but it is having equal opportunity just as Kate Turnbull said, equal opportunity to live in a decent place. The second is independent living. The idea is not that you do something by yourself. The idea is what you choose to do by yourself or with others. Independent living is about choice. The third, is full participation. You may call it the least restrictive environment, you may call it inclusion, you may call it full participation, whatever you want. But the idea is that Jay spends Friday night at the beer house, Saturday night at the fraternity house, and Sunday morning he goes to church to make up for all the sins that he's <laughs> See what I'm saying? And the fourth is economic self-sufficiency. One of the techniques is to marshal your assets. Now, we lawyers talk about bankruptcies and marshaling assets, but you want to find out what the public resources are, match them to the private resources, and then build the informal supports into that whole picture. Once that's done, then where you're headed is to these four outcomes. And if your individualized educational probability does not show how you're getting to these four outcomes, tear it up. Tear it up. It's not sufficient. It may be legally correct, but it is not sufficient. If you cannot have an explanation from educators, professionals of any kind about what they're doing will take you so these four outcomes, 
Our next lesson that we draw from our family story, and this has been all the way through it, but to nurture relationships. You know, Ron and I have three college degrees uh, each, six between us, and it was not what we knew that enabled Jay to have this life. It was, the, and it was not who we knew, but it was the quality of the reciprocal caring relationships that opened the doors and made things happen. One of my most profound lessons came from a woman who was the co-owner of the local taxi company. And there's a lesson there to learn from so-called ordinary people. She didn't have letters after her name. She wasn't one of the therapists or the psychologists or the administrator. She was a local taxi owner and she taught a profound lesson. Long story that I'll make shorter is we wanted Jay to learn to ride a taxi, but we were really scared that maybe the taxi driver would bully him, the taxi driver might steal his money, the taxi driver, uh, God forbid, might drive him off somewhere and molest him. Aren't those awful thoughts? But we had to think, how does he, how do we make sure that he's safe and treated with dignity in a car? And so, knowing that nurturing relationships was at the center of things, I went to see the local taxi company, not knowing exactly what I was going to say, and I went in and there was a woman there named Shirley who, who was dispatching this kind of, in this rickety trailer, and um, she asked me what I was there for, and I was embarrassed to tell her these worries because this was her company, and she owned a taxi business, and I didn't want to, to reflect bias against that. So she started asking me, and I started telling her, and she was so understanding, and she was doing all this active listening, and she was saying she was a mother, and she didn't blame me. She would think that too. And, I could have been in a therapy session that cost $150 and not gotten as much out of it as I got from Shirley. But uh, then she opened her rickety desk and she pulled out one of these crumpled green pieces of construction paper. And, and then she had some red construction paper. I was aghast and I said, what is this? And she said, Ann, you're at the university. You get to help people every day. I'm a taxi driver. I care about helping people every day. And she said, every morning, I ask the good Lord to let me take as many red cards as I can from others and to give them my green cards. She said, you've given me your red card about fear and about stealing and about being molested. And here's my green card of friendship. And here's my green card of helpfulness. And Here's my green card. We're going to do this together, Anne, and your son is going to ride in a taxi. I had tears coming down my face. You can imagine this profound lesson. And if there's something we want you to hear, is that we think our great life lies within support from the disability system. And support from the disability system could have made this easier for us. But the ultimate support for an inclusive life has to come from the inclusive community. And there are so many people with green cards. There are so many people who have never been asked. And if I had taken a short bus of eight or ten people with disabilities into Shirley's trailer, I don't think I would have gotten the same response. One person felt very manageable, and that's why we have to break down in size. The long and short of it, she set Jay up with one driver. They became good friends. She was on the dispatcher the whole time. She said, I don't want to limit Jay, so after one driver, we'll introduce another one and another one until he knows all 22 drivers. And she said the reason that she chose the first driver is because he needed a friend as much as Jay Turnbull needed a friend. She saw reciprocity from the outset. 
So that's a lesson. Nurture relationships. And that will open doors to a great life. Create your own village. And one of the things that Rudd and I did is to modify what's often done in person-centered planning. Do a lot of you do person-centered planning? We are usually at the time of the individual plan, especially for adults. Then you talk about what would an ideal day look like and who were the important people. But we felt the problem with person-centered planning is often it's all planning and no action. Because we come back a year later and say the same things and nobody, nothing has changed very much. Or the family goes home and feels like if there's a change, they've got to do it all. And it feels to a manager or one staff member feels like she or he needs to do it all in the same manageable. What we did, and we're going to talk about it some later in, in uh, the next workshop, is we call it group. What's that next word? Say it with me. Action. We needed action. We needed planning, but we needed action. <clears throat> and there are particular tips. There's a handout that Molly has that perhaps can be on the um, art website for those that don't get to the next session of detail, step by step. How do you put together a group who stayed with us for years? Our meetings were more like celebrations and parties than they were like IT meetings. Meeting monthly, working step by step to get the group, uh, to get the planning done every that, month. That, that supported watering. <laughs> <laughs> right, a relationship. Okay, so the next lesson from the group action planning, <clears throat> we were able to embrace the law of accumulation. Now, this is accumulation. And what we wanted when Jay was expelled is what, what we wanted is overnight great life, right? How can we make this happen as quickly as possible? It took us years to put all of the parts together. But the law of accumulation is every time <coughs> one cell <coughs> on this chart is filled in with nurturing relationships, you're a step closer to a great life. And little acts, little decisions done regularly every week eventually add up to a whole life. And we have to keep the faith that it doesn't happen quickly, usually, but it can happen very effectively, decision by decision, step by step. So run. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get my high school education here in Connecticut. I walked into the classroom in my, uh, I guess my junior, my, no, my freshman year, and on the desk of the teacher was a yoke that you used to put around oxen. And on the blackboard behind him, there was a blackboard in those days. Some of you were doing it. That's 130 uh, years ago. It was, it was 130 years ago. And uh, on the blackboard behind him, were the following words. Before the gates of excellence, the high gods have placed sweat. Just stop right there. Just go back for a second. Before the gates of excellence, the high gods have placed sweat. Sweat is a noun, but sweat is a verb. And part of the lessons of life, and I need not tell any of you this, is that you have to sweat to get what you want. But here's the rest of it. <coughs> Long is the road there too to the gates of excellence, and rough and steep at first. But when the heights are reached, the law of individualized probability. When the heights are reached, then there is ease though grievously hard in the winning. So the lesson 
is to sweat, but remember, you're a member of a team. That was the whole point of Ann's previous points. One of the other lessons is to breathe solid. You want to, you're skipping one right there? Mm -hmm. Oh, did I, did I skip something? Oh, a part of sweating is that you're never satisfied with what you've done. If, if you, Anne's father, construction engineer, built the second largest building in the state of Florida after Cape Canaveral, said, you never know what your best is. You never know what your best is. And so as we are sweating to get this great life, we have to take time to reflect on what we have done and what we need yet to do. And so part of this great life is to continue to have the self-criticism that leads to the next best step. Your best effort today will not be, and should not be, your best effort tomorrow. And as we sweat and grow, we have to do something else. Everybody raise your hands like this. <laughs> Very good. Now, deep breath. Everybody? Mark. <laughs> Because we've oxygenated ourselves. No, that's one reason. It is because we have been compassionate to ourselves. And one of the other lessons of life that we have learned is that if we don't take care of ourselves, we will not be able to take care of other people. There are three dimensions of breathing some. The first is the physical care that we owe ourselves. The second is the emotional care that we owe ourselves. And the third is the spiritual care that we owe ourselves. So as we grow our lives, as we sweat some, as we do this, we must breathe some. And here is a picture of a plaque underneath the base of a tree planted directly outside of the offices at the University of Kansas, where we worked and where Jay worked. In memory of Jay Turnbull, KU employee for 21 years. Breathe some. Breathe some. The next lesson <clears throat> that we draw in our family story is to balance family life. <clears throat> and if you think of our family, we had three children. So uh, during this time of adolescence and early adulthood for Jay, <clears throat> when things were particularly challenging, there were five of us. And if you think of a family, sharing the, the resources, sharing the time, sharing the energy. <coughs> Excuse me, let me. <coughs> Talk without, that's, <coughs> I think, a little better. Um, in sharing the time and energy, you might think that our family bundle of energy and time and attention might be divided into five approximately equal parts. And even though things in the family system are always changing, that we would strive for everybody in the family to get their needs met. We knew from learning from other siblings. How many of you in here have a brother or sister with a disability? I don't know if you think, you know, like many siblings do, when you look back on childhood, that maybe the brother or sister with a disability needed more time and attention 
And that may have meant that you got less time and attention. We knew that was happening, and we were really trying to keep that in mind. And yet, we were getting these phone calls every day. We were trying to change this agency that didn't want to be changed that we, were, we knew Jay was very depressed and spending a lot of time and time out. There was so much we needed to do. And so um, it, we, were, and we were trying to keep our jobs going, but time from our jobs, things kept pulling into Jay. My younger daughter, our younger daughter Kate, who is now a therapist, um, and I were uh, preparing a sibling presentation several years ago, and we were talking about this balancing time and energy. And I kind of drew something. I said, Kate, I, you know, how does this look? You know, during those turmoil years for Jay, you know, it seems to me that maybe Jay, you know, even got at least half of the family time and energy, and then. What Dad and I tried to do is split the time between you and Amy, and then we felt like there was very little time for our own wellness, as Rod just talked about. I said, how does this look to you? And this was really hard for me to hear, and you know, you'll see why. She said, Mom, I think it was more like this. Ooh that she really perceived as the youngest child, that she knew our family was as extended as they could be, and that the way she could contribute to the family was to need as little as possible. The bigger times for Rudd and I were she saw us at work. You know, so we were over here at work a lot of the time. We were advocating for Jay so much of the time that it was very hard to have much left over for Amy and Kate. And so many programs that fail families don't understand this devastating impact of when there's not support for one member of the family. Think how life would have been different if the adult service system had offered supported living and supported employment. Another thing that was very important in the dynamic in our family is Jay was 11 years older than Kate, and he was eight years older than Amy. When he would have aggressive behavior at home sometimes, that was really scary for them. And that dynamic of having fear about Jay's behavior was something that was difficult for them. And yet I've seen no family positive behavior support program that really embraces the psychosocial impact of problem behavior on brothers and sisters and developing the support for that, as well as focusing on teaching appropriate behavior to the person with a disability. So a lesson is, as building a great life, it's not just a great life for Jay, it's got to be a great life for everybody in the family. And how do we balance the needs of everybody as we are pursuing overcoming so many <coughs> societal barriers related to disability. So, right. In Jay's last year of high school, he was the manager of the Walt Whitman football team at the Walt Whitman High School in Bethesda, Maryland. We were on sabbatical, uh, supported by the Kennedy Foundation. We were working in the Senate in the House for four days a week. And Jay was going to Walt Whitman High School. That was the first high school, that was the first school ever into which he was fully included. His teacher, now full professor at the University of Kansas, we recruited, said, We've got to include Jay. She went to the coach of the football team. She said, Do you need another manager? Coach said, Yes. Good, said Mary Morningstar, the teacher. I've got one for you. Next day, Jay shows up. He becomes the manager of the team. She didn't say anything about special education. She didn't say anything about limitations. She didn't say a word about disability. She simply said, you need another manager. 
and he said yes, and he got Jay. Jay's job was to hand out towels to every guy who played football. And in Maryland in the fall, if you're playing football, the only time you need a towel is if you're bloody, because it's not that hot. But every guy got a towel. Season ends, the football banquet begins, a big home, hotel and such as this. We're new to Maryland. We're sitting at the special education table, way back in the corner of the room. Jay gets his letter. He's up there. He's patting himself on the back. He thinks he's the best thing. How did he get up on the podium? Football players got him up. Football players got him down. End of the banquet. Three women walked up to us. They said, we are the mothers of the tri-captains of the Walton football team of uh, 1988. Jay Turnbull is going to earn his letter jacket. And he won't get it until April. And this is December. <coughs> Our boys drew lots to see which of our children would give Jay his letter jacket. And on Monday morning, this is Saturday night, and on Monday morning there was a locker with Jay's name on it, and hanging on the edge of that locker was a Walt Whitman football varsity letter jacket. Why is that story important? There are two reasons. One, reciprocity. Jay would not have had a letter jacket if he had not been the manager who gave every boy a talent. So part of what is the lesson of life is to create opportunities for reciprocity. Years passed. And Jay, having had the dignity of receiving a letter jacket, and the dignity of work, and the dignity to live independently, and the dignity of friendship, is ready for his shower one morning. And death comes. You can never be prepared fully for what happens. Dignity is that which is inside of each of us, no matter how limited we might be. Dignity is an inherent attribute, but dignity is also that which occurs when we treat other people with respect. And the question that I want you to leave here with is this. Who treats whom with respect? Where does it happen? When does it happen? Why does it happen? How does it happen? And why don't we have dignity as a standard of performance in everything we do? In the Department of Labor, in the Department of Transportation, in the Department of this, that, and the other thing. Within the art, within everything, all ten sponsors here, ask yourselves, what am I doing? What is my agency doing to pursue dignity? And the way I think it's best, and Anne thinks it's best, for you to leave here is to listen to this eulogy, two eulogies, at Jay's memorial service. Our little church was built by 75 people to hold 750 congregation church. There was not a seat available on the day we memorialized Jay. And our colleague, Michael Wehmeyer, gave this as a eulogy. Listen to it for a moment. We have to do technology. But Jay's ultimate lesson to me came this past week. When the press release announcing Jay's death was posted Wednesday night, I paused 
after I read the link from the KU homepage to that news release. That link read this. It said, University mourns longtime employee Jay Trimble. Think about that for a moment. That headline could just as easily have read, University mourns a son of distinguished professors. Or University mourns a special worker. Instead, the headline points out a simple fact. The J was a person in and of himself, independent of who his parents were, or whether he had a disability or did not have a disability. He was a person who worked for 20 years and who contributed greatly to the mission of the Beach Center, the Lifespan Institute, the School of Education, and the University of Kansas. And in reflecting on that headline and thinking about Jay and his impact on my life and the lives of others, I realized that the most important lesson Jay taught me was not really about the possible lives that people with severe disabilities can lead that people with severe disabilities could live in their own homes or perform meaningful work or lead full social life. These are important lessons. I, I don't want to un undermine those. But those lessons are really about the business of education or the business of rehabilitation or the myriad of professions that provide the supports that sustain Jay and people like Jay. No, what Jay taught me, and what I believe he taught so many people around the world who join us today to mourn his passing and to celebrate his life, was that we are not in the education business or the rehabilitation business or any other business. We are each of us in the dignity. By the quality of his character and the example of his life, Jay reminds us of the dignity of living full lives. Lives rich with friends and family and the dignity of work and the security of home and the joy and the gift that is each and every day. message is that we are all in the dignity business and the challenge for all of us is to pursue diligently. And the last lesson is this, never postpone joy. It's interesting that the word joy could be the word J if we were to switch one vowel but never postpone joy. And Anne, and I have told you about our daughter Kate. This is part of Kate's eulogy for Jay. You've heard one eulogy. Here's the other one. Just listen to this. It, yeah, it's not the whole eulogy. Turnbulls have a way of speaking a long time. <laughs> But this is an excerpt. You can tell I'm not very good at this. You're better than I am. You need some help. Right here. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. This is a new example of assistive technology. <laughs> She's the assistant. My new best friend. The last time I saw Jay was over Thanksgiving break. He and I drove out to Wendy Parent's house to visit the animals. Wendy offered him a choice of four different pies, and Jay had a slice of three of them. <laughs> He cleaned up after himself, he pet the cats, he gave Wendy a soft five, and we were off 
But the party, I'm sorry to say, Wendy really started when we got in the car. I was blasting the soundtrack to Hair, which was always one of Jay's favorites, and we were singing, shouting, more like it. He was doing his bounce and flapping his fingers, and his eyes were crossing a little like they did when he was really having a good time. But I looked over at one point, because it's hard to keep your eyes on the road when you are jamming out with Jay Turnbull, and he looked at me right in the eyes, and he had this little smile of joy, of contentment, and of love, and I thought, there is God. There is God. There is God. November Thanksgiving holidays, Kate had come home for the holiday, and then Jay died in January, a couple of months later. That day, when they went jamming on hair, uh, Amy, Kate's sister, had tried to convince her to go shopping with her. Uh, Kate had some things in the family that we needed to take care of, and I said, Kate, this is a good time for us to do that. No, she insisted that I can't do those other things. I want to spend time with Jade, never knowing it was her last time. But keying in on what he loved the most, music, meeting him with his preferences, and having this joyful, joyful experience that she will carry with her for the rest of her life. None of us ever know and to never postpone joy, to enjoy and celebrate the full being of our family member and friends with disabilities is so critically important. And all of these other lessons, yes, there's sweat, and yes, there's our best effort, and yes, there's sick and enviable life, but to always, always remember to never postpone joy. So we want to just quickly review <clears throat> which two do you want to take from this presentation <clears throat> and put into practice today and tomorrow? Which two do you want to, how many of you feel that your calling is to seek an enviable life and that's something you want to work on? Raise your hand. How many say nurturing relationships? How many say you've got to create your own village and your own reliable allies because it's too hard to do it all yourself? How many of you can embrace the law of accumulation and celebrate every small step, knowing that every small step is going to add up? How many of you recognize that what you're going to need to do is to sweat in order to get the hard work of systems change done? What about growing your best effort, knowing that just because it was your best effort today, you can learn lessons and have a better effort tomorrow? Who can push yourself to that next level? Who wants to breathe? I can just breathe in one more time. Hands up. Yeah. We all need to breathe some. To balance family life. To pursue dignity diligently. And let's all say that one of our take homes is going to be to ne never, postpone, never postpone, postpone joy. joy. One more time, I didn't hear you. Never postpone joy. It's been a joy to be with you this morning. Thank you all very, very much.